Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this, are, this video is for my Honors Bio students, um, Chapter 23, Patterns of Inheritance. If you are an AP student, I would encourage you to watch my AP videos on this so that you get all the content that you need. So as I'm getting us set up here, I'm gonna make myself a little bit smaller. Um, keep in mind that down in the descriptor of this video um, on YouTube here, that I have a copy of the notes that my students are um, using and column one I, is the scaffolding of the notes which I'll help you fill in as we go through it and then column two I encourage you to put in pictures that are helpful and useful for you and there's also a link to this entire presentation um, that you're seeing right here is um, associated with those notes all right so let's get started so if you're going to talk about inheritance you're talking about how we pass our DNA down through our descendants how we get that information passed on and the father of genetics his name was Mendel and I want you to know my students because if you're in my class right now we have already discussed mitosis and meiosis and the whole chromosomal dance Mendel didn't see any of it Leeuwenhoek had not uh, made his microscope yet that he could use um, to see the chromosomes he did all of this from experimentation and he worked with peas so here he worked at the university of vienna and i just thought i'd show you their botanical gardens so um on your notes um column one mendel's laws background austrian monk studied math and science at the university of vienna he was known as the father of and this is what you put in the notes genetics and um nobody even knew what he had discovered until about 30 years after his death did they know uh, the implications of what he had done. So what did he do? He worked with peas and what he would do is he would cross fertilize peas. They were easy to work with. Um, he was a son of farmers, so he knew how to grow, uh, how to farm. And then he would look at their different traits and look to see, well, if the parents look like this, the offspring look like this, the grandchildren look like this, um, what's happening there? So on your notes under Mendel and the Garden Peas, you have everything about easy to cultivate. And here's a slide about that, I believe. He used a lot of math, a lot of statistics, very carefully prepared, controlled experiments. He looked at 22 true breeding varieties that were simple and very clear cut. I'm going to tell you when we discuss the exception, exceptions to Mendel's laws, we'll talk about things like a uh, red flower and a white flower creating a pink flower. He didn't work with anything like that. It was like a tall plant crossed with a short plant. They all turned out tall. They were very clear cut. I gave you all of that um, in your notes already. And then what, um, in order to do that, because peas have both male and female gametes that they generate, he could cross fertilize. So he could take um, a true breeding tall plant and cross it with a true breeding short plant and they could fertilize each other. So that those are called reciprocal crosses and you also already have that in your notes. So let's get a few names down. I think it's the next slide, good. So a parent generation is who you start out with. So if he was breeding a true breeding tall, that means generation after generation, you would always have these tall plants and cross that with a true breeding short plant generation after generation. Um, when you mix those together, when you, when you cross, cross them, um, then all of the offspring turned out tall. And that first generation of off, offspring is called an F1. So we, you know, did the short trait just disappear? or you know what happened there well he would take these f1s and cross them with each other and the f2 this would be like the grandchildren right parents children grandchildren i need a pointer let me get a pointer okay um the, like the grandchildren is the f2 in about a three to one ratio he would get three tall and then one shorter, 25% short. So the short trait would pop back up. So he knew you hadn't lost the trait here. You hadn't lost the trait, but it was hidden from view, okay? Because short is recessive to tall, but it showed up back here in the F2 generations. Now, um, my students, you remember this about homologous pairs, same size, same shape, and code for the same characteristics. So what happened is this parent generation gave the, the member of what it gave, it gave a tall allele. The short generation gave a short allele. So in their homologous pair, they had one tall, one short in the F1 generation, 
tall is dominant over short, so the plant grew short. But when you start interbreeding these, then you have a one in four chance of getting this short trait. So let's fill in our notes. Um, under generations, you have parental, tall versus short. In the offspring and the F1, they were all tall. Second generation, the F2, a cross, and this is would be a monohybrid cross, you got three tall to one short. And that is a good preview for the law of dominance because tall is dominant over short. And so underneath the law of dominance, I'll preview this one with you. One traitor factor can be dominant over another. Now, when you read Mendel's work, he calls them factors, not alleles, because that name didn't develop yet. He didn't know about that. Remember, he never saw a chromosome. Okay, so those words, that phraseology hadn't come up. And then for your example under law of dominance, tall plants are dominant over short plants. Tall plants are dominant over short plants. So what you're seeing right here, I want to make sure I didn't skip two slides here. Okay, I'm good. This is referred to as a mono hybrid cross. Mono means one. Hybrid means it's a mixture, right? And so what happened is when he crossed his F1s, these are the, F, the F1s right here. Remember they had um, if we go back here, I don't want to lose you just in case. Okay. These are your F1 generation. So they got one tall allele and they got one short allele. That's why they are a hybrid. Okay. So when he crossed them, this parent, if you had a big T and a little T in some of your gametes, right, you would give the big T and in some of your gametes, you would give the little T. So what you do is you just put your potential gametes at the top. This is called a Punnett square. And then the female's potential gametes are here. So what are all the different combinations you could get? The center right here of your Punnett square, these are your zygotes. So edges, your gametes, the center are your potential zygotes. It doesn't mean that this pea plant is going to have exactly four children or four offspring. It's just giving you percentages. So in that combination, it's potential for them to get a big T and a big T. That would be what's referred to as homozygous tall. Okay. Homo means same. It's big T and a big T, right? So this individual right here would definitely be tall. This got a big T from mom in the gamete and a little T from dad in the gamete. This would be what's referred to as a heterozygote because it's different, big T, little T. Now, one thing to learn about when you're giving the allele letters, okay, is that whatever the dominant trait is, in this case being tall, to indicate the recessive trait, you just give the lowercase letter of that. It's not true always, but generally speaking, and for my class, that's what it'll be. So this little T represents the short allele. Okay, so you get a big T, little T. Here, mom gave a little T. That's a possibility. Dad gave the big T. This also is a heterozygote, but still tall. So that's what explains these three talls. Homozygous tall and probably two heterozygotes tall. How does this short trait come up again in the F2s? Well, a joining of the two, dad gave the short and mom gave the short allele, and that's the only way you're gonna get short. Now, I have blue eyes. Can you see them? I don't know, because my glasses are off. The only way you can have blue eyes is it's a recessive trait. Brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. So I had to get brown is dominant over blue, okay? So two little Bs, I got one from my mom and one from my dad to give me blue eyes. That's a recessive trait. The only way you can see a recessive trait is if you have two copies of it, okay? And there's a one in four chance or a 25% chance in a monohybrid cross that you would get that recessive trait. So what kind of traits do you look at? He did tall versus short and tall was dominant over short. Round peas versus wrinkled peas. Now, what color peas do you eat? You eat green peas at dinner, I bet. I, I've never seen yellow peas in the grocery store. But I'm going to tell you, yellow peas are dominant over green peas. So just because a trait is dominant doesn't mean it's going to be the most prolific. Like, look at the fingers of your hand. My hand has five fingers on it. I bet yours does too. This is a recessive trait. The dominant trait is having six fingers is the dominant trait. But we don't have that, right? Now, there's a teacher at my school who has six fingers. Um, he had them, his parents had them surgically removed. He 
he had got one of those from one of his parents and he got the five finger trait from a different parent, but he had six fingers. He just had them surgically removed. Just like my hair should be brown with gray, but my environment changed my hair color, named my hairdresser, right? So even though my genotype said that I should have brown hair with gray all over it, my environment um, changed my hair color um, to this blonde color, all right? So our environment can influence the way we express our traits. Okay, and that'll come up later too. So when you do a Punnett square, you might wanna just pause the video for a minute and try doing that, okay, where you're crossing, and so you would put like, you know, I'm gonna pause, pause me if you want to, okay? So you would put one big T here, one little T here, separate out the gametes. You would do the same thing here, and then here in the center, you would put what are all the possible combinations. Now, let's talk genotype and phenotype ratio. Genotype is what do the alleles say? Phenotype is how is that expressed? So let me show you how that would work, okay? So I did it, okay? So I took big T, little t, big T, little t, here are all the different combinations, okay? I just put the big T in front of the little t every time, okay? If it was combination. So the genotype ratio is what do your alleles say? Well, I have one, big T, big T right here. So I put one big T, big T. I have two big T, little t's, and I have one little t, little t. That's a one to two to one genotype ratio. Phenotype is what it looks like to your eyes. This one would be tall. It's got two tall genes, right? Two tall alleles. This one would be tall and this one would be tall. So I have three tall to one short. And for my class, don't ever give me naked ratios. Make sure you tell me the genotype or the phenotype that you're referring to. So if you say the phenotype is three to one, tell me what it is. Three tall to one short or three yellow to one green, whatever that might be, okay? And there's a place for that down in the notes and I'll help you with that right when we get there, okay? So um, next, Mendel's Laws. So there are three big laws that we wanna know. Law of dominance, which you've actually already learned. Law of segregation, which has to do with meiosis. And law of independent assortment, which also has to do with meiosis. So those for my students, those two will be a review. All right, so law of dominance, we can see purple flowers are dominant over white flowers. So notice two big P's, homozygous purple, okay? Homozygous white because both of them are the white alleles. And here, both of them are the dominant alleles. In the F1, when you do that kind of cross, all of them will be heterozygotes, okay? And if you cross these F1s or self-fertilize it, then you would expect that three purple to one white. And then here you can see the genotype ratio, even though they didn't write it, one big P, big P, two hybrids, and one little P, little P. And we already have the notes for that. Okay, and this is to show you again, um, three genotypes um, uh, yield two different phenotypes, right? So we have three different genotypes, but only two phenotypes in this situation. And remember, yellow peas are dominant over green peas. All right, now let's talk about Mendel's Law of Segregation. So alleles separate, each go to a different gamete. Now you know about when we, um, let me review this real quick. Let me get big up here. Okay, so you know about in meiosis one, right? The chromosomes become visible in prophase one, crossing over occurs, right? Synapsis and crossing over. Metaphase one, they meet in the middle and they can line up any which way they want. That's independent assortment preview. But segregation, you separate the homologous pairs. These are sister chromatids, these are sister chromatids. You separate the homologous pairs in meiosis one and you form two cells, right? In each of those cells, you do meiosis two and then you separate the sister chromatids. But the homologous pairs got separated during, during um, meiosis one, and that's the law of segregation. Meaning if you have a hybrid plant, right, that's big T, little t, you're not gonna have any gametes that have two Ts in them. They're only gonna get one copy of the T, all right? So on your notes, um, law of segregation, um, let me give you, wait, before I give you the notes, let me show you another one, okay? Here you can see the law of segregation right here. You're separating your homologous pairs in anaphase one. So in summary, this is in your notes, each individual has two factors or two alleles for each 
um, trait. Why? Because we're diploid, right? We got one from mom, one from dad. The factors, that's what Mendel called them, separate during the formation of gametes in anaphase one. Each gamete contains only one factor from each pair of factors, right? One allele from the pair. And fertilization will restore it, right? When the two gametes, when a sperm fertilizes an egg, that's when you restore the homologous pairs. That's when you restore um, the two factors, and that's letter D. Fertilization gives restores each new individual two factors on homologous pairs for each trait, for each trait. All right. Um, here you can see the factors. If this was, you were doing a monohybrid cross, right? So you separate the factors, you separate the alleles. That's the law of segregation, right? And then also for the female, you separate it. And then here you restore the homologous pairs when you form the zygote. Now, when you talk about um, the casing, the pod around the peas, the dominant trait is green for the casing around peas. So in this case, if you crossed um, two hybrids, a monohybrid cross, you would expect three to one green, and you have um, you know, uh, two phenotypes here, green, and then this is like a, a whitish color, okay? And then you have three different genotypes. Homozygous right here, homozygous dominant, these are heterozygotes, and these are referred to as homozygous recessive. Same, same, and they're both the recessive. So let's put that on our notes. Alleles are defined as alternate forms of a gene, alternate forms of a gene. So it's either big G or little g, alternate forms of a gene that occur at the same gene loca location, like on the homologous chromosomes. Um, a dominant allele will mask a recessive allele. A dominant allele will mask a recessive allele. And there are exceptions to that, and we'll talk about that later. Um, the genotype, think genes, what's your DNA say, your genes. If you are homozygous, right, you could be big T, big T, or little t, little t. That's homozygous. Both alleles the same, or big G, big G, little g, little g, homozygous, same, same, okay? Um, heterozygotes would be big T, little t, or big G, little g, or big N, little n, right? Those would be hetero. These are different, right? It's the same letter, but one's uppercase and one's lowercase. And then the phenotype is the appearance. What does it look like is the phenotype. So in this case, these are green pods, and this is a white, whitish pod, or tall versus short, tall versus short. All right, so to review, this is a homologous pair of chromosomes, okay? These are alternate forms of a gene, big G, little g, like I just said. And when you do your Punnett squares, you separate the G's from each other, you separate the R's from each other, etc. Okay, these are homologous pairs of chromosomes, and each of these traits are in the same location. All of these happen to be what? Heterozygotes or homozygotes? Heterozygotes, right? Because big G, little g, big R, little r, big S, little s, little t, big T. All right. All right, next, if you look at phenotype, blue eyes is a phenotype. To get blue eyes, you need two little b's because b is recessive, okay? These eyes are brown, so the phenotype is brown, what they appear, how it talks via proteins, right? And the genotype, could we don't know. If somebody has brown eyes, we don't know if they're big b, little b, or big B, big B, because either way, it will be expressed in the same way. You will lay down that brown pigment in the eye. All right, next. So here's just another one is about widow's peak. Okay, so widow's peak is dominant over a straight hairline. So right here, you can see a widow's peak where there's any kind of point there, and then a straight hairline is coming across. This would be a widow's peak. So you can see genotype and phenotype. Whether you're a homozygous dominant or heterozygous, if you have a big W, the phenotype will be a widow's peak. The only way to get a straight hairline across is if you're little w, little w. Okay, so hairlines, what's dominant? Widow's peak. So try this right now. Now I'm gonna tell you in this slide presentation that you are seeing me um, display right now, um, I have a few practice problems, but if you go into the notes 
and you click on a link um, to this presentation. I have a ton of practice problems for this entire chapter. They're located at the very end of the slideshow. And I ask a question and then I give the answer and then I ask a question and I give an answer. So if you want some more practice, just download the notes and there's a link on there and that's in the descriptor of the video. So if you were gonna cross two heterozygotes for Widow's Peak, give me the genotype and phenotype ratios. I encourage you to push pause right now and do that cross because I'm gonna go over the answers with you. All right, so heterozygotes for Widow Peak would be big W, little w, big W, little w. So this is how you would set it up, okay? In this case, they put the sperm here on the side and the egg here on top. Uh, um, you, typically the eggs are put on top, but it really doesn't make any difference as long as you separate out the gametes, right? So what would you expect in, you know, for your zygotes? or your zygotes, right? So this would be widow's peak, homozygous, right? These would still have the phenotype of widow's peak, but the genotype is a heterozygote. This is a homozygous recessive. So as far as your ratios, this would be a one to two to one genotype. For phenotype, three widow's peak to one straight hairline. All right, now cross for me heterozygote for widow's peak with a homozygous recessive. And just hit pause, okay, because now I'm gonna show you that, okay? Here's a heterozygote for Widow's Peak crossed with a homozygous recessive. And when you're doing these Punnett squares, be careful with things like S's and W's and P's because the uppercase and lowercase letter look a lot alike, okay? And so here you can see heterozygote, homozygous recessive. Let's look to see how that would play itself out. Right. And in this case, when you give me ratios, you always simplify your ratios. So you won't go two to two. You would say one to one, one big W, little W to one little W, little W for the genotype and one widow's peak to one straight hairline. Now, if you do a cross and they're all going to end up having widow's peak or straight or whatever, then just say all. You don't have to give a ratio or say four to zero or anything like that. Okay, so we have looked at the possibilities with one trait. We're going to level up and get to two traits, and then I'm going to show you a shortcut for that as well. So this would be considered getting ready for a dihybrid cross, and we're going to talk about independent assortment. So we're going to talk about this first, and then we'll get to a dihybrid cross. So if you had this right here, so you can see from the dad, and you can already see the S stage of interface has already occurred because you have sister chromatids here, right? And these are sister chromatids. This whole thing is a homologous pair. This is considered one chromosome. This is considered one chromosome, even though it's replicated itself. If it lines up this way, what, and they do their separation, B from B and E from E, what would you get in the gametes? And then you need to consider, maybe it doesn't line up this way. Notice I have little Bs and big E's here. What if this had flipped, okay, and it looked like this, okay? So the littles were all on one side and the bigs were on. It could do any which way it wants because remember one homologous pair is independent of the other homologous pairs. And so this just is one of the ways you increase variety. So on law of independent assortment in your notes, in summary, think of um, metaphase one, each pair of factors, so each pair of factors or alleles segregates or assorts independently of the other pairs. You have all that in your notes and all possible combinations of factors can occur in the gametes. All possible combinations of factors can occur in the gametes. So let me show you what I mean by that, okay? So if I just listed, I've got a big B, little b, so I've listed that first. I just color-coded them with mom, dad, but it doesn't make any difference. And then what else do I have? Big E, little e, okay? So big B, little b, big E, little e. Now, if I only had big Bs, you would just easily go, oh, one gets big B and one gets little b, right? And same thing with E's. But now I've got two different chromosomes. What's gonna happen in the gametes? Do you remember from math, foil, first, outside, inside, last? So what you can do is you can take, well, what are the first two possibilities? Well, a big B with a big E, right? that would be foil. So you try that, pause, figure it out, and then I'm gonna show you the answer when you do that foil. These would be your possibilities. First, big B, little e, outside, big B, little e, inside, little B, big e, last, little B, little e, okay? 
all these could be the four different possibilities let's say of sperm right four different possibilities here so if we were going to uh you have one on there on your notes dihybrid cross possible gametes for each and so you could list those off like we did right here just as a reference if you wanted to okay so now um i need to teach you something else um, we're going to get to a dihybrid cross, and that is Mendel and the laws of probability. Okay, this is going to help you because you're going to learn a shortcut here uh, in a second. Okay, so here are two coins. You and I right now are going to flip a coin. I'm going to flip this first coin, and you're going to flip the other coin. Now, what are the odds that I get heads? Half, right? What are the odds that you get heads with your coin? A half. So together, what are the odds that I get a heads and you get a heads. Well, laws of probability says we multiply it together. There was a half a chance for me and there was a half a chance for you. A half times a half is a fourth, right? So we had a one in four chance that both of you and I, if we flip a quarter, that both of us would get heads, right? And you can already envision that, right? One in four heads, heads, one in four tails, tails right and then any kind of heads tails combination there's two ways to get that i could get heads you could get tails right or i could get tails and you could get heads so there's two different ways to get that so we have to add that up so that would be the summative law right okay so let me show you that okay i'll show you that here let me show you right here okay i could get heads you could get heads a half times a half a fourth of a chance together you and i both get heads um tails um, half and half, a fourth of a chance you and I could have both flipped tails, okay? That is the product rule. So look on the notes where it says the product rule of probability to find out the chance of two different events, me flipping a coin, you flipping a coin, occurring together, both of us getting heads at the same time, um, you multiply the chance of them occurring independently. I had a half, you had a half, together we have a fourth, right? And the same thing works um, for tails, tails, right? Now, let's talk about this. What about a heads, tail combo of any kind? I get heads, you get tails, you get, you know, or the other way around. So there is a fourth of a chance, right, that if I get heads and you get tails, there's a fourth of a chance, or flip it around, um, I get tails and you get heads, there's a fourth of a chance. Since there's two different ways to get that combination, we need to add those two together because there's two different ways to get the same outcome. So a fourth plus a fourth, right, is a half because there's two different ways to get a heads tail combo. I know it's coins, but it's going to help you with your genetics. So that's the sum or additive law um, rule of probability. If the same event can occur more than one way, um, then add their probabilities together. And I gave you examples of that in your notes. All right, put a pin in that. We're going to come back to it. So take a look right here. Okay. If we did a parental cross, big R, big R, big Y, big Y. Okay. What are the only kind of gametes this P can get? The only kind of gametes this P can give is a big, big R and a big Y. That's the only possibility, right? How about this? What are the only kind of gametes this P can give? Little R and little Y, right? So um, all of the offspring then, as a result of that, would be big R, little R, big Y, little Y, okay? This is what's known as a dye hybrid. This is a hybrid and this is a hybrid. So it is a dye hybrid. So what happens when I want to cross two dihybrids together, right? A dihybrid cross. I need to then figure out, because remember, I got a big R, big Y from this one, a little R, little Y from this one. So this is my F1. Now I want to cross these two F1s. So I need to do FOIL, right? Big R, big Y, big R, little Y, little R, big Y, little R, little Y. These are all my possible gametes, right? And this one is all my possible gametes. So now all of a sudden I don't have a square of four, right? Just four total. All of a sudden I'm doing four by four, right? So that is a much larger Punnett square and it looks something like this. Now, Again, I'm showing you the long way so you can appreciate the shortcut. So you would just line up all your gametes here and line up all your gametes here and you would just start putting all of your combinations together that you could possibly get, okay? So this is a two-trait cross. And so here, 
I did it for you. I put all of them and all of them here and I did it. And then what you would do is you would look at each of these. These are all the genotypes, right? I'm not gonna ask you to do the genotype ratio. Then you would look at what is this phenotype? This would be um, round and yellow. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you because this big R, big Y is right here, all of these will be round and yellow. And because this gamete has both dominant traits, all of these would be round and yellow. So I would start to fill those in. And when you do it, if you look at this phenotype ratio, remember the, down, the dominant trait was round and yellow, okay? Of these 16 offspring, remember this is just a ratio, how many of them have the dominant trait? Well, I can count up nine. Nine of the 16 have the dominant trait. Three of them have one of the dominant traits and three of them have the other dominant trait. And only one of the 16 is a recessive recessive, being both wrinkled and green. So this is a nine to three to three to one ratio. Oh, I'm right over it. Okay, a nine to three to three to one ratio. Now, what happens if we do a trihybrid cross? It's even bigger, right? Instead of having 16 squares, let me tell you, you'd have 64. So there must be an easier way to do it. And that's what I want to show you, the shortcut. The shortcut is do individual punnets. Cross just your R's and just your Y's, and then you multiply the probabilities together. What are the odds of them coming together in that way? Just like you and I flipping the coins together. Okay, so you multiply the prob probabilities together. That's using the product rule. And on your two trait crosses on your notes, it says do individual, um, sorry, I have an interview coming up, so I needed to look at my phone really quick. Um, it's in five minutes, I'm sure I can finish it. Two trait, two trait crosses, do individual punnets for each trait, and then you multiply those probabilities together. So. If I looked at just my R's and I did a punnet of just the R's, and then I did a punnet of just my Y's, okay, what are the odds of round and yellow? Well, remember we said that there were nine out of 16 that had that dominant trait. How could you do that easy, easily? Well, three out of four here are gonna be the dominant trait and three out of four here are going to be the dominant trait, the yellow trait, so I multiply that together. Okay, so three fourths, right, times, just like the coin flip, three fourths, three times three is nine, four times four is 16. Nine out of 16 will have that phenotype, okay? And let's, how about this one? Let's, instead of looking for a genotype, let's look for um, a phenotype here, oh, sorry, it's still, the other one was a phenotype too. Um, let's look for wrinkled and green. Well, what are the odds of wrinkled Remember, little r, little r would be wrinkled, okay? Little y, little y would be green. So that's one-fourth and one-fourth. What is that going to be, right? So here you go. One-fourth times one-fourth. One times one is one. Four times four is 16. Remember, we said nine to three to three to one is going to be then wrinkled and yellow, okay? And um, the next part on your notes um, says chance has no memory. Um, and so I'm, I'm now kind of look above where it says two trait cross, chance has no membrane. So if you look here, this dad has freckles, this mom has freckles, but yet they had children that didn't have any freckles. So what do you think everyone's genotype is? Well, if freckles are dominant over no freckles, right, then they must have each been carrying a freckless allele, the little F, which combined here into their children. So dad must have been a big F, little F. Mom must have been a big F, little F. And then they had a one in four chance for their first child to have no freckles. But they had another kid with no freckles and another kid with no freckles. And the reason why I'm telling you that is Chance has, oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> chance has no memory in the fact that just because your first child had no freckles, it doesn't mean that the next three children have to have freckles. Every time it's a new event and it's whatever that, you know, whatever that chance is. So um, each offspring underneath chance has no memory. Each offspring has the same probability of inheriting a trait. Each offspring has the same probability of inheriting a trait. It is not dependent on the genetics of the offspring before it. It is not dependent on the genetics of the offspring before it. 
Okay. And the last thing I'm going to do in this video is test cross. Okay. Here is a purple plant. Okay. Here is a white plant. I know purple is dominant over white. Okay. Now I don't know the genotype of this purple plant. I don't know if it's big P, big P, or if it's big P, little P. Well, what would the, the um, offspring look like if it was a big P, big P genotype? And what would the offspring look like if it was a little P, little P? Well, if you cross it with the homozygous recessive, you know it's always going to give the little P, right? And if the parent plant happens to be um, homozygous dominant, big P, big P, and you know the other parent is always giving a little P and all your offspring, right, will then be purple because that's all this one plant has to give. But what if they are heterozygotes? What would you predict if that purple plant was a heterozygote? Right, you would expect half to turn out purple and half to turn out white. So what a test cross is, is if you don't know the genotype of a dominant trait, like somebody with brown eyes, you don't know if they're brown brown or they're carrying the blue eye gene. Who would you cross them with? You would cross them with a blue eyed individual because the blue eyed individual will always give blue eyes. And if the unknown genotype is homozygous brown, all the children will be brown. But if they're a heterozygote for brown eyes, you would expect half the children to show up with some blue eyes. So test cross, the purpose is to determine or confirm the genotype of a dominant phenotype to determine or confirm the genotype of a dominant phenotype. And then I asked you a question there in B and I bet you can answer it. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop this video at this point. And uh, if you're one of my students, I will see you in class.